evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we tell in dramatic form a story written by Octavus Roy Cohen called The Final Tribute. It's about doctors, and like many such stories, it gets pretty close to the mainsprings of human experience, which I suppose is the reason why stories about doctors are often so moving and popular. The Final Tribute, indeed, offers us in its way a sort of comment on life, for both the doctors in it were good, but they were good in different ways, and how often this kind of difference faces us in life. Anyhow, for our star tonight, we have one of the finest and most beloved actors of the screen in the theatre, Edmund Gwen. And now, a word about Hallmark Cards from Frank Goss, before we begin the first act of The Final Tribute. Hallmark Cards have a magic carpet quality about them. They take you visiting, however great the distance, to help celebrate a birthday, an anniversary, or just any day when you're thinking of someone. There is a quality about Hallmark Cards that whispers good taste, and you'll send them with pride, for that identifying Hallmark on the back adds meaning. It says you cared enough to send the very best. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Octavus Roy Cohen's The Final Tribute, starring Edmund Gwen. My dear Anne, this is a letter I should never write, and can never mail. And writing it at all is only a piece of sentiment on the part of an old man. And yet, some things have happened in the past few days that have brought you very close. Some of the things happened to you and to me in what seems now to be another lifetime. Some of them should have happened. A few hours ago, Cynthia came into the room. The clock was striking, and I was sitting here alone, pondering the problems one ponders during the watches of night, and... Uh, Uncle Joe, do you realize what time it is? Cynthia spoke of the time, and, and then she came over and sat by my desk, and the past came in with her. I found myself thinking, your mother might have spoken to me in just that manner. She might have come in, too, in a, in a blue wrapper. And in a voice that comforted and pushed the shadows back, pointed the way to rest and dreams. And something inside me wept. As I looked at Cynthia, wept because I was old. And the moments that slipped away were past redeeming. She was puzzled as she looked at me, and, and I realized I still hadn't spoken. Uncle Joe. I, yeah? My God, I... I pulled myself back to reality and, and answered her. <laughs> I said, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Cynthia. I, I'm afraid I was just sitting here gathering dust. Is something wrong? A great many things are wrong. Some of them are many years beyond changing. Some may not be. But it's the ones that may not be that I've been thinking about tonight. Uh, what, what's wrong between you and Donald? Uncle Joe, I've told you. Nothing is wrong between Donald and me. Nothing is right. There's... Nothing there at all. No, I find that very hard to believe. I've seen you together. I've seen the way he looks at you. And yes, I, I've seen the way you looked at him when you forgot to be on guard. I haven't the slightest personal interest in the world in Dr. Donald Kent. But, Cynthia, I'm going to tell you a story. I think now I should have told it to you a long time ago, but even for a doctor, it's difficult sometimes to uncover old scars, to let wounds gape open. Perhaps, especially for a doctor who knows so well the depth of the wounds. What are you trying to tell me, Uncle Joe? Your mother. I've never talked to you about your mother. Oh, Uncle Joe, you don't have to tell yes, me. Yes, yes, I do have to tell you. I, I always knew that someday I would. I, I, oh, Cynthia, let me, let me think how to begin. How can I begin? I don't know how long I sat there, searching for the words to give life and breath to a memory. I thought of you, Anne, and I thought of youth, delight, and dreams. I thought of you, and I thought of laughter, and I thought of tears, 
excitement of music rising to a great crescendo. And then I looked at Cynthia and I saw your face looking back at me the way you had looked the first time I met you. I closed my eyes. I could hear your voice and, and I was able to tell her the first word you ever spoke to me. You know, my father's told me so much about you, Joe. I, I feel as though I know you already. I'm glad we've met at last. You smiled up at me and your words kept pounding inside me at last. At last, at last. And the moment cast a spell upon me and my heart had found its own. And, and to remember those days is to remember excitement and, and life going by at a dizzying pace. Oh, Joe, surely you can walk faster than that. Faster, Joe, faster. Remember those days is to remember sleigh bells and a sharp, exhilarating wind full in our faces as we rode through Central Park at breakneck speed into enchantment. Oh, Joe, isn't it exciting? There's no one in the park at all today but us. We could almost believe there was no one in the world but us. Remember those days is to remember a garden. The garden one dreams of through all one's youth and finally enters. Oh, Joe. I've waited so long for you to ask me. Darling, of course I'll marry you. Of course I'll marry you. those days is to remember the unrealness of sudden reality and the voice of your father. Joe, I've done some talking to the board about you and I've arranged for you to be appointed to the staff of this hospital. Yes, sir, but... Well, I tried to tell your father that while I appreciated his offer, I'd studied medicine because my own father had stinted and gone without. Saved the money to send me to New York to study. I tried to tell him that the dream of my father's life was to have me return to Watertown and help him with his practice there. And I, 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 I'm afraid I wasn't able to explain it very well. In the name of heaven, boy, think intelligently, not emotionally. You can't bury yourself and Anne in some hick town. You come home with me and talk this over with her. And so I went to your house, that splendid Park Avenue mansion, to talk to you about in Watertown. Joe, this is where you belong now. Not Watertown. Uh, you can grow here. You can help medicine grow. This is one of the greatest hospitals in the world. I asked you, point blank, whether you would or would not go to Watertown with me. Joe, I think it'd be wrong to let you turn your back on an opportunity like this. I think it'd be wrong to go with you. Oh, Joe, where are you going? Joe, wait, don't go like that. I love you. Don't you believe it? Joe! I turned back. I caught you to me. I was young. I was in love. And in the brief moment that I had turned from you, I glimpsed the future and seen only darkness without you. I told you I'd go to Watertown and talk to my father. I'd try to make him understand. I caught the train that same night. I was less than 24 hours too late. Your father's dead, Joey. Your father's dead. The services were simple. I sat in the church, listening to the quiet words of the minister whose life my father had once saved. I sat looking at the faces of the people he once served, now quiet and sad they bade him farewell. And after the services, I saw their faces and they turned towards me. And I'm glad to see you here, Joey. Your father said you'd be back to take over for him. I walked home through the silent streets to a silent house. He had stood between death and them as long as they had known him. Who would stand between them now? Oh, I... I 
walk the floor of the live long night, back and forth, back and forth, love or duty. Well, someone else could do it, but he had asked me. He hadn't realized how much he was asking, or perhaps he had. Love or duty? New York or Watertown? Oh, Anne, Anne, Anne! When morning came to Watertown, I sat down, spent and weary from the night of indecision, and wrote to New York. I told you that I loved you and would always love you. And, and, goodbye. As I sealed the envelope, there was a knock at the door and I... I'm sorry to bother you at this hour, Doc, and at a time like this. But our little granddaughter has a stomach ache. We don't know if it's anything serious, but we'll I'll come. come at once. God bless you. That's what your father always said. I went to see the child. It was nothing serious. Oh, just too many green apples. The Carter children never have been able to eat green apples. And on the way home from the house mail, I mailed the letter to you. And then, I walked back to my father's house and I... I hung out my shingle. Joseph H. Walton, M.D. Watertown. We'll return to the second act of the final tribute starring Edmund Gwen. The importance of words is a subject I've often talked to you about. And the other night, while I was reading one of the essays of Joseph Addison, I found a statement by that great English scholar which I'd like to quote to you. A statement as true today as it was in the 18th century when Addison said, Words, when well chosen, have so great a force. No one appreciates the power of well chosen words more than the makers of Hallmark cards. That's why the words in a Hallmark card accurately reflect your own feeling, whatever the occasion. Heartfelt congratulations, warm birthday or anniversary wishes, or just a thoughtful hello to distant friends. There's a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And what is true of the right words in a Hallmark card is equally true of everything else about it. It's artful design, quality materials, superb craftsmanship. In fact, when you ask any group of friends what name they think of in greeting cards when they want to send the very best, they quickly answer, Hallmark Cards. Yes, you choose Hallmark Cards with the pleasant knowledge that they are correct. Their social preference has become a tradition through the years. That's why it's so easy to remember. It would be difficult to forget to look for the Hallmark on the back. It says you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton in the second act of the final tribute starring Edmund Gwen. Dr. Joe Walton sat in the small office his father had used before him, writing a letter to a girl he had once loved and writing in a mood of tender reminiscence. Yes, Anne, writing this letter is only a piece of sentiment on the part of an old man. But you seemed so close tonight while I was telling Cynthia your story. I told her that about a year after I came back to Watertown, I read of your marriage in a New York paper, and, and then I knew there was no longer anything to dream or hope for. But there was work for me to do, yes. Yes, I spent the years bringing other people's children into the world, and then bandaging their knees, removing splinters, taking out tonsils, and every one of them was mine from the moment I slapped their first cry out of them. I told Cynthia all these things, and then I told her of the motor trip you had taken with your husband, and of the accident. He was killed instantly, and they called me over to the hospital at the county seat to perform an emergency operation on you. Oh, I knew there wasn't much hope, but I did what I could. And then I sat by your bedside until dawn came and... and you regained consciousness. Joe. 
What are you doing here? Uh, you were in an accident. We take turns doing emergency night calls here at the county hospital. This was my night. Joe, you of all people. Oh, Joe, I'm sorry. So sorry for such a lot of things. If only I'd gone to you. Shh, 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 shh. You must be still. Don't try to talk. Joe, where's my baby? She's sleeping. She's perfectly all right, Anne. She won't have anyone now. My father's gone and now... Joe, if anything happens, would you take her? Would... would I take her? Yes, Joe. Take her and raise her here where you were raised. Teach her the good things, the solid, fundamental things your father taught you. And when she finds love, see that she holds on to it. Tell her it only comes once. Only once. Will you take her, Joe? Yes. Yes, of course, Anne. Of course I'll take her. Thank you, Joe. I'm tired. I think perhaps I'll sleep now. Good night, Joe. Cynthia became the child of my heart. She brought warmth into my house. She brought life, and most of all, she... she brought happiness. As she grew, I'd look over each young man that came to town and think, is this the one? But he never quite was, and then... Dr. Donald Kent came. A fine, handsome young fellow who was right up to the minute on all the new things in medicine. It didn't take him long to build up a practice. He'd drop in now and then and chat or ask to ask Cynthia to go out, but uh, she resented Donald and went to no pains to hide it. Uncle Joe has some calls to make, and I'm going with him. I understand you've been turning down night calls, Dr. Kent. Yes, I have. Don't believe in babying patients. Of course, if it's a genuine emergency, that's, that's one thing, but 99% of the 3 a.m. calls aren't emergencies at all, and I'm not going to make myself a slave of my patients. Now, now, look here, son. You're building up quite a practice already, and you've got a fairly heavy operative schedule, and you need your sleep at night. So why don't you let me handle night calls for you? Oh, Uncle Joe. That's you. <laughs> no, I, I couldn't do that, sir. After all, you're the senior doctor. I ought to be taking work off your shoulders, not you off mine. <laughs> I kind of felt you'd take it that way, boy, but... Don't you see? I practice medicine differently. Why, well, I've been doing night calls for years. I'd really like to do it. I'd really like to do it, son. I was kind of pleased when Donald's patients started calling me up at night. Well, he was right. Most of the calls, they weren't emergency calls, really, but I felt better for having gone. I never did think it was enough just to cure people's ailments. No, you had to keep their minds at ease and their hearts at rest, too. Cynthia had it in her mind that Donald wasn't a good doctor. Ho, 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 ho. But we learned differently this spring, yes. There was an accident. Fifteen youngsters injured in a school bus collision just down the block. Donald was right there where he was needed that night. He turned his house into a hospital. All right, wheel this boy into the bedroom, will you? It's going to be all right. Uh, uh, put the next case on the table there. Be careful. Careful now, easy. That's right. Now then, anesthesia. Oh, uh, Dr. Walton, will yeah. you get the next boy ready? I've no, got to work as fast as possible. Yeah. Dr. Kent, before I go, I just want to say that I've never seen any man do a job like this in my life before. There's at least eight kids that are going to live. Thanks to your work tonight, I'm proud to know you, son. Really proud. Yes, after Donald's work that night, the Watertown Chamber of Commerce decided to present him with a silver cup for being the year's outstanding citizen. Cynthia was very silent as we rode downtown to attend the ceremony and... And I was troubled. 
I wanted to help Donald and Cynthia find one another, understand one another, but I didn't know how. <laughs> no, no, I watched Donald as the mayor presented him with a cup, and for one fleeting moment, I wished that I had been able to serve my town as he had, and earn a moment like this. He looked at the cup in silence for a long time before he spoke. Yes. First of all, I want to thank you for this tribute. But I also want to tell you that I've... I've come to realize that I've had the wrong attitude in a lot of ways about my work. A patient needs more than just a physical patching up. He, he needs a personal reassurance as well. I've come to realize that from watching another doctor. That doctor has gone out night after night, summer and winter, year in, year out, to give you a feeling of safety and security whenever you needed it. From him, I've learned the true meaning of medical practice, and so I ask your permission to give this cup to a man who has devoted his entire life to you. I wish to present it to Dr. Joseph H. Walton with the humble wish that someday I may be half the doctor he is. I came home, I sat down at this desk, looking at the silver cup, and wondering what I could do about Donald and Cynthia. And then the clock struck three, and she came in the room, and I started to tell her the story just as I'd written it down. And when I had finished, she was very quiet. Seems like such a waste, doesn't it? You and my mother. Oh, if she'd only come to you. If you'd only gone to her and made her come back with you. She asked me to tell you that love only came once and to hold on to it. Those were almost her last words, Cynthia. My child, Don told me he asked you to marry him and that you turned him down. I didn't have any respect for him until he... he said what he said tonight. Tonight, when he made that speech, I... I sort of changed. Oh, now, who on earth is that? It, it's past five in the morning. Doesn't anyone ever go to bed in this house? I saw your lights from the street. Come in, Don. What are you doing up at this hour? Oh, I was having a case. Oh. Something serious. No. Betsy Carter had another stomachache. <laughs> Green apples. Eh? I'll bet you anything in the world. How did you know, Doc? Well, none of the Carters have ever been able to eat green apples. Don. <laughs> Don, you went on a night case? Well, I'm going on a lot of night cases from now on. Well, I think it's just about my bedtime. Oh, no, Uncle Joe. Wait a moment. Don... A few weeks ago, you asked me to marry you. Do you remember? Yes, I remember very well. Well, then, if you still mean it, I'd be very happy to marry you. Cynthia. Well, now I really am going to bed. Don, thank you again for putting into words something that this old doctor had felt in his heart about his patients, but never knew how to say. Thank you for last night, not for the silver cup alone, although I'm most grateful for it, but... But thank you for giving me peace and the knowledge that at last I'd chosen correctly that this was where I belonged. But I didn't go to bed. No, after Don left, I came down to write this letter to you, Anne. A letter I can never mail. A piece of sentiment that can only be filed away with the other memories of a love put by. And yet it warms the heart and helps the pain of those memories to know that your daughter, my Cynthia, will find and keep the happiness that we found and lost so long ago. Gwen and James Hilton will return in a moment. I'd like to again remind you that even though it may seem a long way off, October and November will quickly disappear, and Christmas will be here before we know it. Remember last year you resolved that next year you'd get your cards early? 
Well, next year is here, and right now is the time to make out your list and start thinking of your Christmas cards, if you're really going to get them early. Sending Christmas cards will mean so much more to you if you have time to choose them with care and thoughtfulness. And Hallmark cards will help you to be most thoughtful because you'll find there is always a Hallmark card to say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. I know you'll find pleasure in choosing Hallmark Christmas cards because they are so extraordinarily beautiful, the kind your friends will single out to show to others, display proudly during the holidays, and treasure long afterwards. Like other distinguished products that have won social preference, Hallmark cards can be obtained only at fine stores. And you have that comfortable knowledge they are correct. You have added pleasure, too, in sending Hallmark cards because that Hallmark on the back is so instantly recognized. Like the sterling on silver, it carries its own high tradition. It says you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Edmund Gwen, our deep thanks for your performance. We've been honored to have you star in the Hallmark Playhouse on a number of occasions, and it's always a pleasure we look forward to. <laughs> always a pleasure to be here, Mr. Hilton. And when I'm not here, I always try to listen well, in. Oh, good. I, I hope you enjoy listening as much as we enjoy having you on the show. Oh, thank you. By the way, knowing that Kansas City is the home of Hallmark cards, I was most interested in reading the article on Kansas City in the current issue of Look magazine. Yes, indeed. It's a fine article. You know, we dramatized the Kansas City story last season direct from Kansas City itself. Mm. We found it a great place. Yes. Oh, and, uh, and talking of Look magazine, did you catch the CBS ad about our Hallmark Playhouse in the same issue? Sure, I did. And tell me now, what have you chosen for next week, Mr. Hilton? Next week, we're dramatizing a novel by Jesse Lynch Williams entitled Not Wanted. This is a charming story about a boy and his father and the problems they had to face in separation. And for our star, we will have invited that delightful young actor, Dean Stockwell. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was adapted by Dean Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you carry enough to send the very best. Edmund Gwen can currently be seen co-starring in the 20th Century Fox production, Mr. 880. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Dean Stockwell in Jesse Lynch Williams' novel titled Not Wanted. And the week following, Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, starring Lionel Barrymore on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.